Derek, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. Thank you. I just rushed back. Thank you for... We are still uh, waiting. I just spoke to Shrikant. Um, because we, he said we'll just uh, talk once and then we'll admit okay. everyone. There are 59 people. Wait, let me let me first check my thing. My, my talk. Yeah, there's no hurry. <clears throat> Okay, now let me see if I can share screen. Yeah, very nice. Okay. I need to, last time I couldn't, I got stuck with this. I was unable to see the, okay, now it's okay. No, it but, no now is what it? to do is, sir, uh -huh. you need the slide, no? Sorry? The slide, you have various options. Uh -huh. Uh, just uh, bring it to, uh, or go on top, display settings. Display settings. Where, where, one, I is don't, one is yeah, 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 yeah. Just and click then, on that. Yes. Uh, it's so, got swap, presenter view swap. and slideshow and duplicate slideshow. Which must I put? Do, do the top one. Yeah. So what? Yeah, now keep it on this. Keep it on. Okay. okay. What 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 does this do? This means only. Otherwise, you can see two slides, no? So everybody can see that. One second. Uh, hi, Shrikant. Um. What what name have you entered? Your name. Okay. I'm just uh, Dr. Russell is also in. Shesha Shri. Shesha. Okay. Okay, no, I saw that I was a little worried. I said maybe um, somebody else's account you had used. One second, I'll just see. So what was I seeing before, Derek, when I, because that's happened, what, uh, when you, uh, when I had it before I put this display. No, there were two, there were two um, slides visible, the present slide as well as the next one, you know, so that's a little distracting and you only want the participants to see one slide, no? Oh, that was what then my problem was. Yeah. Yeah. I did not but know how to do perfect. that. I've admitted oh. you, sir. Okay, so so you put share and you go up, is it? Is that what we do? No, this is the standard setting. Don't change it now. It shouldn't. Okay. All right. Uh, Razal, good, good. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. Uh, Razal, I can't hear you properly. Good Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, let me see. I'll find out. Hello. Hello, Saurabh. What's happening? Srikant, I've made you co-host now. I'll just um, <laughs> uh, adjust the others and then I'll make you. Yeah, no, that's okay. And one more thing is I, I'm sending you the... Yeah, I think, may I suggest one thing, uh, yes. Derek? One second, I'll just put up that. Der Derek? Yeah, go ahead. I think uh, Radha Krishna texts me that people are waiting in the waiting room for too long. Why don't you send a message or... I've I think done, I, done, done already. I, I think allow them, allow them and mute, mute them. Okay. And, and what I'm doing is I'm sending you the IAOPM slide. You put it as a background. 
Right. Okay. So you want me to admit all, or should I, I only admit the your IOPM people? I think admit all the people, but the important thing is uh, uh, they'll all be muted anyway. You can just send a message to all of them. Please bear for another fifteen minutes. The meeting starts in another five minutes. Sorry. Um. Can you do that? No, the thing is, see, once they are in, then they can access, they can hear at least what is our conversation. No, so that is a call you just need to take. Okay, okay. See, uh, in any case, we are not yet. I'll, I'll, I'll send another message if you want that. We shall be starting in ten minutes. But, so, but, but, but they'll be getting that message, is it? Yeah, they'll get that message. Okay, yeah, I think please do that, and I'm sending the IAOP more view. It's not you, yet you. late, no, so it should shouldn't be a problem when. If yeah. we were running late, it was a different issue. Yeah, yeah, we we haven't yet crossed the time, no. So yeah, sure. And also, may may make one suggestion. Once you start the link, the YouTube YouTube link. Yes. Put it as a chat message for everyone. Yeah, yeah. That I'll put in the chat message for everyone, and I'll send it to you on WhatsApp as well. Please, please, yeah. So, yeah. so that uh, what happens is uh, you can forward it uh, easily from the uh, WhatsApp to others as well, and then they can forward it. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's fine. But I think uh, if it goes to the chat, that's good to start with. Yeah, one moment. No, then uh, people who are not in this meeting, no, in the chat means only people who are in the meeting will have to share. Once I send it to you on uh, your um, WhatsApp, you can send it to one or two groups, and from there they'll keep forwarding. I know. I'll do that. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Okay. I have sent you that over overview slide, and also I'm sending you the presentation. Subodh Dawes is. Too long. I'll ask him to load it himself. No problem. Uh, I, I I'm not able to get his presentation at all. But I think that's it. I just uh, I'll be I'll just have to go to the printer. I'll be back in one minute. Okay. Subodh Dave's presentation is too long. Okay. Um, I'll check with him whether I don't know. I think whether we will be able to load it or not because uh... all right. Let him try. Otherwise, as co-host, you can always share screen. So, not an issue. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Okay, so you're you're dealing with the sending the chat message, yeah? Yes, but already done. Excellent. Okay, I'll just go to the printer and come in a minute. Okay, thank you. Oh, sure, sure.
Shall we admit uh, everyone? I think so. I think because so. Because that will take another two, three minutes. Yeah. And also, the people that you need to make co-hosts are Tony Gatti. Uh, one second. No, I'll just admit all and uh, then... One does, but we all jail all. Our IMA president is here too. And we have uh, Rajiv Padan. So please, can you make him a co-host as well? Yeah, yeah I'll make, I'll make Rajiv a co-host. He's already there. Yeah. So only support uh, now. Welcome, Dr. Jalal. Nice to be Dr. with you. Dr. Jalal, you can put on. Yes, good to see you, sir. And congratulations in person. Thank you, virtual person. <laughs> uh, Last uh, time you were uh, traveling, uh, I think so. Rajiv, Professor Rajiv, this is Dr. Jalal. Professor, he's the new IMA president of the. Uh, oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And that's it. Hi, Rajiv. Good to see you. Jailal. Yes, sir. Yeah, we are great. Nice to see you, sir. And good day, um, uh, Thiam. Thank you. Rajiv. Is, uh, Melbourne, uh, head of the unit in Melbourne. And hello, Annabelle. Good to see you, too. Hi, Dr. Mondas. Yes. How are things, you? sir? Yeah. How are you, man? All good, all good. Always busy <laughs> with all webinars. Mm. <laughs> they infected yeah. by the worst virus, no? Yeah, what to do? <laughs> All of us, but it's good to be together. So it's a webinar <laughs> epidemic, man. Webinar epidemic. I have got <laughs> three programs today. <laughs> okay, three programs today. Eric, I would like to just bring to your attention that people are waiting in the waiting room. Can you allow them in, please? Yes. And also, can you send a message to everyone, the link for the YouTube? Yeah, I'm doing that. Regards. Professor Mohandas. Yes, Rigaham. How are you, man? I am doing fine, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> you I think I would like to inform everyone that we have a YouTube link which you can share with your colleagues who are not able to join this conference live. Um, so it will be streaming on YouTube and eventually you'll also have a uh, Shrikant, you'll have to speak again. I think uh, Dr. Russell muted everyone. So, yeah, just go ahead, please. Yeah. One second. Sh Shrikant, uh, we, we were muting all the participants. And uh, can you repeat what you were saying? Because I think no one heard it. Right. I was just saying that uh, we have a YouTube link which uh, participants can share with their colleagues or friends um, by various uh, means so that uh, people can join the conference by YouTube. Eventually, after the conference, we'll also be able to send a IEOPM 
link so that people can watch the full program. So I think let me get started with the conference today. Um, firstly, welcome all for the first virtual IAUPM conference. This is hosted by the Academic Center of IAUPM based at Chesterfield Park Hospital, Doncaster in United Kingdom. And thank you for joining us from various countries. I know that you are in different time zones. Some of you are, for some of you it is early morning, for some of you it is midnight. Uh, but in UK it is 10 o'clock in the morning. What time you think? And I'm very pleased to inform you that this is the first of the two IAUPM conferences for this year. And there is a significance why we have arranged this conference at the current time. This is partly in the light of the COVID pandemic. There are so many challenges and so many tensions amongst workforce across the world. And this conference aims to address some of the challenges and also some of the conflicts uh, in the workforce. And we have an excellent line of speakers who are going to talk us about some, how to grapple some of these challenges and will also offer some insights and, their, and some solutions. Firstly, before I um, go and talk about the conference, I would like to highlight very briefly about IAUPM. Uh, Derek, would you mind sharing the slide screen, please? Okay, I think essentially uh, IAUPM has its humble origins uh, in Australia. Um, which this is developed by Professor De Souza, who is amongst us in the audience. Um, and he has started this more than 60 years ago and subsequently this has expanded globally uh, across many countries. And we have registered offices in Australia, in USA, and also in UK at Chesterfield Park Hospital. Over the years, I think um, there has been growing concern in terms of uh, some of the work-related psychopathologies in organizations. And IAUPM is aimed at promoting positive mental health awareness and also research in organizational psychological medicine. So one of the main aims of IAUPM is to enhance human capital potential. And for me, it is important to highlight to you what human capital essentially is. It is a sum total of individual intelligence built on knowledge, skills, and abilities of the workforce. And harnessing the human capital potential, i.e. that is accumulated skills, experience, wisdom, and also the capabilities of the workforce is very crucial in terms of increasing productivity in organizations. So how is IAOPM going to achieve that. Essentially, IAUPM is working towards preventing work-related or workplace-related psychopathologies, identifying them and managing them. When we talk about work-related psychopathologies, we are referring to issues like burnout, stress, embitterment, demoralization, compassionate fatigue. And IAUPM has, has been leading um, in relation to addressing some of these difficulties uh, over the last few years. I would like to highlight that we have uh, organized many seminars, symposiums, and conferences, both in UK, India, and USA over the last few years to enable people to gain more understanding and also offer some insights about some of the challenges um, faced by the workforce and also how organizational um, uh, uh, organizations, particularly senior management, can address some of these difficulties. So how does IAUPM aim to achieve some of these objectives? Essentially, can we move to the next slide, please? 
essentially IEOPM is uh, working towards increasing sophistication in the human capital management practices by using the underpinnings of neuroscience, positive psychological medicine, cognitive medicine and spiritual philosophy. It's also supporting the senior management in furthering their understanding in the workforce. For example, there we are developing and helping organizations the ability to map and nurture the inner needs of individuals and align them with organizational objectives and goals. In addition, we are also educating senior management and other senior professionals in identifying and preventing psychopathological sequelae resulting from workplace issues and also building resilience in the human capital. All this is to increase the return on investment in the human capital in any organization. In addition, we are also providing support using scientific principles of corporate social responsibility and well being programs in organizations. Over the years, um, we have published articles, we have brought awareness in some of the issues that I've highlighted in both in a um, uh, number of articles, seminars, symposiums, and conferences across the globe. In addition, I would like to highlight that we are um, working with o Oxford University Press. In fact, Oxford University Press have commissioned a textbook from IAOPM, um, an, an international textbook on organizational psychological medicine. And we have more than 70 authors contributing from various parts of the world. So this would be the first textbook in this field, which captures and addresses various work-related pathologies, but also give a broad scope in terms of understanding various issues related to organizations. We had a conference at Chesford Park Hospital two years ago, and uh, we had a similar conference in um, Michigan University last year, which was attended by delegates from across the globe. And I think we, we are understanding with various issues uh, that individuals are encountering in any organization and we are working towards addressing them. To understand this and to further research in this, the IAOPM board has uh, nominated Chesford Park Hospital as the academic center of the Institute. And we are carrying out small pilot projects in various parts of the world to further, some, uh, further our understanding in some of the key areas related to the workforce. So there's a lot of work that is happening in this field and I invite all the participants and any, 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 any employees in any organizations to continue to contribute to this field to further our understanding about number of issues that, are, uh, that we are grappling today in today's society. Increasingly, COVID-19 pandemic has thrown a significant challenge to all of us. And the aim of this conference is to understand some of these challenges. And also some of the speakers today will offer their insights and also some solutions for some of the problems we are facing today in the light of the pandemic. So I'm very pleased to um, open this conference, but importantly, I also want to invite Professor Rajiv Tandon, who is the chair of the IAOPM board, who has joined us today to say a few words in terms of the future of the IAOPM and also any other insights that he would like to share in the current situation. You, Over to uh, you, Rajiv. Uh, Rajiv, uh, wait to introduce Professor Rajiv Tandon is the chair of, an, of the Department of Psychiatry at the Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. Uh, and of course, he's a, a well known uh, uh, in, in the world of psychiatry, where one of the lead, leading publishers and researchers. Uh, and uh, I'm very delighted that Professor Rajiv Tandon is uh, the chairman of the board, the IAOPM International Board, is joining us here. Welcome, uh, Rajiv. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Srikant. And welcome, welcome everybody uh, to the first virtual IOPM uh, conference. I want to congratulate uh, Shrikant uh, for having organized this conference, as he has many others uh, through the years. 
uh, across the globe. Uh, it really is a global effort, this. Uh, and, you know, right now, today, the time zones across the viewership and the participants, the delegates, the speakers, really speaks to this. Uh, it's, and it really covers the four quarters of the day. Uh, here in, in the United States, where I'm speaking from, it's not yet dawn. It's, uh, it's pre-dawn here. It's 5.15 in the morning here. It's 10.15 uh, in the morning uh, in the UK. Uh, it's 3.45 p.m. Uh, in India, and it's 8.15 uh, p.m. in Australia. And I mention these four countries in part because this is where much of the activity uh, in terms of conferences of the IOPM have occurred. This is where the foundational offices, headquarters, uh, and operating uh, offices of the IOPM are. You know, as uh, uh, Dr. Namagada has already shared with us, uh, there have been a number of, con in terms of activities uh, at a local level, national level, international level, there have been several efforts to educate, inform uh, clinicians, uh, policymakers, hospital uh, administrators, really highlight the important role of psychological management uh, at an individual level, at an organizational level, uh, at a policy uh, uh, level, both in, in a, at, in, at the level of a community, uh, a state, a nation, and internationally. So the principles, the objectives that Dr. Namagada uh, outlined uh, in his brief introduction really speak to why uh, psychological, scientific psychological uh, management, which is what the Institute uh, really is all about, is so essential, so critical. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Nemagara has already highlighted some of the activities uh, in terms of the textbook, the first textbook of psychological management that uh, the Oxford University uh, will be uh, is, uh, uh, is publishing that uh, Dr. Nimagada and Dr. D'Souza have been so central uh, in uh, pulling together, as uh, are many other members, uh, uh, speakers, uh, and others on this particular conference. Uh, so without further ado, I know we're running about five minutes behind, so I'm going to give two minutes back, uh, if you will, uh, and welcome you all so that we can get back on track and get on to the essence of this conference, which are the excellent talks that have been organized. And I'm looking forward to a rich discussion that informs. So welcome everybody. Congratulations, Srikant. Congratulations, Russell. Uh, and let's launch the conference. Back to you, Srikant. Thank you, Rajiv. So I, I would uh, like to get started with the um, with the talks today. And the first speaker is uh, Professor Razal de Souza. Um, Razal needs no introduction, um, but nevertheless, I would like to briefly highlight a uh, few things that he has done over the years. Razal is currently the Dean and Professor of Organizational Psychological Medicine. In addition, he is uh, Head and Chair of Asia Pacific Region of the UNESCO Chair in Bioethics, HIFA. Russell has been instrumental in bringing many professionals across the globe, um, be it in India, USA, UK, across the globe. And he's a, um, he's a glue in terms of uniting and joining professionals. And I've seen over the years, his efforts in terms of furthering various aspects of med medical education and also bioethics. He has been instrumental in setting up so many um, units in India and across the globe, bioethics units, and his contribution to this field is exemplary and also inspirational. Over the years, he has obtained a number of qualifications and he is a professor of a number of universities, and I would not like to cite all of them, but importantly, I would like to say he has been a great friend, mentor, not only for me, but a number of professionals across the globe. 
and it is um, one of his passions over the years um, in addition to bioethics has been international institute of organization psychological medicine and is very passionate in terms of working um, with professionals to enable them to gain more understanding in relation to work related psychopathologies and it's very um, pertinent for me to say that in the light of the current pandemic uh, the topic that he is talking today embitterment post traumatic embitterment and productivity is a very relevant topic and um, i think it will be important for us to learn more about this topic and see how we can apply that in our organizations so without a further ado over to you rasul thank Dr. you Rasen, uh, if you could just sorry to interrupt you if you could just change the display setting again, again. on top no yes sir what is is that all right perfect yes perfect sir please go ahead thank, thank you, you for bringing that up uh thank you uh, professor um, uh, shrikant uh, and also professor um, rajiv pandey uh thank you for the uh, one uh, for the nice words and kind of, and it's all of you who have put this uh, we uh, come together and we bring the world together i want to to welcome and acknowledge professor mohan das direct from india uh, several um fellows senior fellows vice chancellors and so forth are here professor sanseti uh, ajaylal they're all fellows of the institute have been, uh, attended the various convocations that have been held uh, and the the conferences that we've had the last year it was in uh, it was in uh, uh, university of Wich- western michigan and then in mumbai we had another conference with monda said organized and so we also had another one at the sri guru ramdas university last year so this has been an important area of psychological understanding where we work in psychological medicine and management coming together to act enhance productivity now productivity first for the individual then it automatically flows on to the family community and indeed the 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 organization so this is the area and so the area of positive psychological health um, is what we're doing so today i'm going to talk uh, on an area that uh, uh, call embitterment all of you uh, who are here would have experience at some stage that you in your work key someone who's bitter about something or the other and i want to take you through some of the things that we now know about understanding uh, the the um, the embitterment and then going on to the post embit post traumatic embitterment disorder and how it impacts on productivity for the introduction the last decade embitterment and post traumatic embitterment disorder have been studied and we have now understood it much better and we actually see that this is a form of what we call an adjustment disorder and we are often associated with dismissals retrenchments demotions or the work for someone feeling feeling perceived perceiving to be devalued at their workplace but what we have learned it takes a chronic course and the other important factor is that it is difficulties are there in treatment it tends to be rather resistant and importantly from the work of uh, linden and so forth they end, we lose due to the ruminations and i'll come back to explain uh, the uh, the um, uh, uh, the neurological issues that once cognitive functioning optimum nearly 70% could be lost and this is the important part i'm sure all of you have experienced or had someone and um, uh, where you uh, heard the terms felt they were bitter now what about history where did this come from the research team led by professor bentley uh, linden in the department of psychosomatic medicine at the university of berlin was initially the ones who uh, did much of the work and it came where they noticed this from the fall of the berlin wall when we suddenly saw the east germans coming in and of course they were a, 
uh, coming to, to um, um, uh, amalgamating, and of course, being coming from a um, probably a um, less uh, developed of, uh, as the West, there was a loss of prestige in society, their economic issues, their qualifications, all these were impacted. And there was a prolonged, serious and prolonged states of psychological distress. And this, of course, was the onset was linked to a specific event where they were, where they, the, the person were perceived it as being frustrating, humiliating, and indeed derogatory. And it, lent, it, ended, it tended to end with a, kind of a persistent, exhausting sense of unfairness, of bitterness. And usually there was a trigger event that brought the whole thing on. Now, what we've learned, this embitterment and the correlates of this are linked deeply to the psychology of justice. So we need to know a little bit about the psychology of justice to understand how these two uh, uh, um, interact, to understand why injustice can have such dire consequences. Dalbert in, in, to, 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 um, 2011 had put out this paper on the belief in a just world, understanding the psychology. You see, from childhood, we are given to a firm belief that positive behavior is rewarded and negative behavior is punished. So we are taken in, and, and this is the, um, the um, uh, way we are taught and ingrained. And, we, and what happens is we have a belief and this becomes a prerequisite for social behavior. And, uh, and it, it's a learned Provide we learn that this provides security and indeed this is the way we influence others uh, by what one does. And of course, willful infliction of injustice means the offense, offender wants to be aggressive and believes that the victim cannot defend him or herself. Sorry. Okay. Now, for all in the when we look at society as it has changed, modern societies, we know physical aggression is forbidden, and this appears injustice appears to be the frequent substitute to physical aggression that might have been there in the history prehistoric times and so forth. And if you look at Willy Brandt's work, he talks of the first reaction to is counter aggression. And this type of aggression has negative consequences. Injustice questions important values in life. And of course, for many, their basic belief system and this belief system is deemed to be violated. We then look at some of the personal theories of the rea of reality, or even in fact, the internal world models that we talk of, uh, Genoff talks about in the shattered assumptions and so forth. We see all these to have uh, an impact here. And then we try to understand how this works. Beliefs are learned. Different persons will react to the same event in different ways. They, al they allow coherent behavior across the lifespan of an individual then are often passed on from generations and indeed also define what is correct, what is incorrect, or what is just or in unjust. And by and large, this is resistant to environmental changes. So we see this embitterment coming in, in, in this way. Now, when life events at a workplace challenge that basic belief, what happens? It, it touches on one's security and assumption that the world is predictable 
and controllable, a very important aspect for most of us. The predictability and the controllability. So if basic beliefs are put into question by events and persons in the workplace, as these persons have a tendency to go to war. So beliefs are endangered. The beliefs that, are that endanger this uh, causes a defense of the basic beliefs. And of course, this dynamically makes them martyrs to fight for it, go to war, you see. So that's an understanding. Now, justice is a critical issue. Importantly, perceived justice, justice persistent and exhausted, exhausted, exhausting feeling of having been wrong, the, in, the perceived injustice ends up or gives a persistent, exhausting feeling of having been wrong, humiliation, helplessness, and a desire for revenge. Unlike anger, embitterment is accompanied by a strong experience of guilt and feelings of having suffered a grave injustice. Now, we see the emotional reaction. That is an example, humiliation, to being severely disappointed by others, or even a serious violation of their basic values. Then we see embitterment is accompanied by other emotions like feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, poor mood and a lack of drive and aggression towards oneself and others. And in the end, it can end in suicide or even homicide at times. Now, understanding the emotion of embitterment, we learn it's a complex, complex emotion accompanied, among others, by mistrust, despair, anger, aggression, grief, pessimism, weariness, hopelessness, dissatisfaction, disappointment, and obsessiveness, and even fanatism. A spectrum of very diverse, but not only diverse, but contradictory emotions. And this is what the, the science has taught us. Embitterment is by its very nature a reactive emotion that having been let down or humiliated includes an important component here, the drive to fight back. And it's been described as a reaction to injustice, to protected unemployment, or to traumatic experiences in the work at the workplace committed by the organization or someone in, 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 in the power or whatever. And they feel the world has treated them unfairly. And it's one step more complex than anger. They are angry plus. Helpless. This makes a big difference. These people usually don't come to a treatment because the world has to change, not me. And what we see from the evidence, not only from Berlin, but from a couple of others in Korea and so forth, will show you that, that 1% to 2% of people in the workforce are affected at any given time with this. Embitterment is the driving emotion that leads to the post-traumatic embitterment disorder in contrast to anger that might be there in the post-traumatic stress disorder. So we see the post-traumatic embitterment disorder is hypothesized to come from a threat to one's belief, basic belief system that has come through and that has been linked to the psychology of justice. Now we took this and put this in perspective. 
Jan, Janet Ballard. And so putting this together looks at uh, principles, events coming in, a trigger point, and there is a perceived breach in support that leads to continuous rumination. Then there's a breach of organizational justice. Again, there are a couple of things happening. Loss of trust in the organization. Hypervigilance for further, looking for further breaches in the organization. We see then a redoubling efforts to gain justice. So there's a uh, ruminations, how to do this and how hypervigilant. And in this process, a persistent a perce a perception of organization as a very unjust organization. And of course, all this leads is continuously increasing ruminations. And of course, Linden's work shows cognitive function going down by over 70%, impaired performance, commitment is lost, enthusiasm to work is gone, and in deeply productivity individually and to the organization are both drastically impacted on. Now to understand this, the phenomenology of the final steps in a row of experience leading to helplessness, when things do not go as expected, it comes to frustration. Now if things could have gone other ways, it additionally comes to disappointment. It, and if perceived that somebody could have done something about it, but did not, it now adds on anger. And if some other person is perceived or seen as guilty, there's an additional act, uh, uh, addition of aggression that comes on. Now look further, because this is something that stretches out, you see? And if one has to admit that oneself should have done something, it additionally becomes shame, add shame to it. And if one is disparaged by others, it now brings on humiliation. And if repeated trials to do something and seek redress are turned down, it makes it worse and despair sets in. And if one ultimately can do nothing more to react, it additionally comes to hopelessness, depression, and indeed giving up. If injustice, infidelity, and feelings of having been let down are involved, it becomes, it ad becomes bitter. And if this involves violation of their central basic beliefs, which we uh, I alluded to in the psychology of justice was built in there, it now becomes severe embitterment. And if the state of embitterment is now unbearable, it come, additionally comes to a rampage. So, in that phenomenology, where they have developed some criteria, diagnostic criteria for the post-traumatic embitterment disorder. I will just quickly run through this because we are in no want of time. There is a core criteria, a single exceptional negative life event precipitating the onset of the illness. The patient or person or client might know about the life event and see their present negative state as a direct lasting consequence of it, the person may experience the negative life event as unjust and resent and respond with embitterment and emotional arousal. When even when reminded of the event, there is arousal and no obvious mental disorder in the year before the critical event and the present state is not a reference of any pre-existing mental disorder. So that is the co-criteria. Co then we have some additional signs and symptoms where the person sees themselves as victim and as helpless to cope with the event 
or the cause. Patients blame themselves or the person or the client or the workforce member blames themselves for the event for not having prevented or not being able to cope with it. They report repeated intrusive memories of the critical event and they even think that some part is important not to forget. And this becomes an important issue in the resolution, in the treatment. There's a need not to forget. Patients express the thought that it's no longer matters how they're doing and they're even uncertain whether they want the wounds to heal. And this is what I talked about, the chronicity and the resistance to treatment. Okay, and there's some other additional emotions of aggression, dysphoria. They show a variety of somatic complaints, appetite, sleep, pain. And of course, phobic symptoms are also uh, take place here. So we go on and it has to be longer than three months. And of course, important, one of the important part is impairment to performance in daily activities and roles. This is impaired. And so we see it being very important to the workforce, to productivity, to the organization. And of course, there are a lot of scientific work has been done. There is the rating scale again developed and which has got a 19 item. I don't have time to go through that, but it's certainly all there. But this has been replicated in, in terms of the Korean um, uh, and they've done it, looked at it and they've come up with 15.4% uh, of subjects could be categorized as having post-traumatic embitterment disorder and they've given some psychometric testing and, and of the scale and they, and that that adds there but it certainly it certainly correlates with the work done in berlin and so forth uh, so this is the south korean um, work that that that's again uh, i've given the reference shin uh, c et al has been doing this work and correlates with with uh, linden's work now, to put it a little bit in, in to bring it here, you know, to see how these two uh, come up with the history, there's a manifestation itself in the context of a relationship. Something has gone wrong in a broad sense. Anger, it presents with anger focused on the organization or also a, on an individual, a manager or the boss with the events cited as evidence of having been let down of badly being treated by their superiors or by the organization as a whole. There's a lack of resolution of events, presence of distress attributed directly to the event, attributed to the organization, to the management or the manager. Strong convictions about fairness. All this has the strong sense of injustice, presence with a strong sense of injustice, unfairness and Correlates with prominent ruminations, effective modulation preserved and often seen in recurrent events in detail. So we look at the contributory factors. We've got a personal contributory factors. We've got the organizational contributory factors, as you can see here. Uh, our, uh, personal strong aspirations, perceived breach of psychological. The important psychological work contract is perceived to be broken to be breached. This is from the personal side, particularly it's related to certain personality traits. From organization, we see some of the, re the organizational situations that can make this worse or even um, um, pre uh, um, uh, preempt the whole thing. So that having said, there is here uh, to show how it, uh, where it differs from some of the other um, uh, high prevalence disorders where embitterment, depression, and the anxiety disorder of, of obsessive compulsive disorder and post traumatic stress disorder. We see here embitterment, uh, you know, expression of injustice, ruminations seem to happen in OCD too, but you could see anger, uh, uh, how these symptoms, uh, when you compare it very significantly and uh, they are clearly apart. And again, some of the tasks, how do we work with this? Uh, work to get the person to acknowledge the problem, behaviors, including the behaviors, reducing unhelpful behaviors, 
developing strategies to reduce rumination that takes 70 percent of the cognitive functioning reviewing personal goals reduce likelihood of escalation the approaches we have used uh, they have been used conventionally the cognitive behavior therapy mindfulness based cbt mentoring problem solving intervention lindens dignity therapy but of course um, again now comes some of the work with the management what type of things that can be done for managers management increasing awareness of the condition and that's what we've been trying to do we have with us the CEO of our academic center of the hospital, uh, Tony, who's going to be used. And so we have a lot of management managers also working with us. And this is the task and uh, reducing collusion with the rumination, encouraging open and responsive communication in the workplace, prompt response to investigation and grievances. Again, workplace, how do we make that uh, improve and the workplace to uh, to enhance this and to improve the situation, attending very important to procedural justice, an important aspect to be kept in mind at management level and approaches, training, support for managers, mentoring of manage for managers and um, mediation, training and providing access, access to buddies, to those going to, for those who are into the HR investigating it and so forth. How do we help? So we've been doing this type of work at, with, with, the, with management. Now, I want to just briefly talk on a therapeutic intervention that uh, the team in Berlin have been using to some with some success called wisdom competency therapy. Now, what do we know about wisdom? What is the construct of wisdom? Wisdom is a multi-dimensional construct and it has a cognitive, reflective, and effective component, components. And it's been defined, wisdom has been defined as an expert knowledge system in the fundamental life pragmatics, or more generally, as the capacity to solve unsolvable problems. Wisdom is a psychological capacity similar to assertiveness or social competency that can help someone cope with past negative life events that cannot be undone, undone and ha you have to leave when what cannot be changed. So he's put the core dimensions of wisdom, factual and procedural knowledge, long-term perspective and contextualism. And of course, putting these together, they look, look, look at how they use he uses this wisdom competency therapy to help in this type of a situation where the not not only there's the chronicity but is all there is also resistance because there is a need to continue there is a need for the wrong to be there to prove and so uh, this is the the 11 dimensions of wisdom that this wisdom competency therapy focuses on you know factual and procedural knowledge long-term perspective contextualism value relativism change of perspective and we talk of empathy but it's actually what we also call trial identification the ability to feel how the other person feels recognition and acceptance of one's own emotions emotional serenity the ability to control one's own emotion, not, in, not allowing them to overflow or, or oneself. And the important issue of distance from oneself is the ability to see oneself through eyes of others and to accept that one is not the center of the world. So uncertainty tolerance and control over one's levels of aspiration, the ability to control one's own aspirations and not make judgments Relative to, relative to what others have or one or what one had or desires to have. So these are the 11 areas that have been focused on in this therapy. And he has been able to show some, uh, uh, some amount of uh, uh, positive uh, improvement. Wisdom encourages the decision to leave behind what happened, gives a new meaning, a sense of coherence to negative life experiences, 
Indeed, helps ex individuals accept and master undesirable emotions and importantly stimulates them to go and look forward. Stops that persistent reactivation we talked of in the post-traumatic where they get reactivated. It stops the reactivation of memories, reduces the emotional strain and stimulates internal dialogue that allows a better mastery of unwanted automatic negative thoughts. So this is the, uh, and the wisdom psychotherapy, which has been derived from the concepts of wisdom psychology and theories about the etiology of adjustment disorder and post-traumatic embitterment disorder. It's embedded basically in a cognitive behavior therapy. It is related to the psychotherapeutic reattribution, reframing interventions. How do we do that? Reattribution and reframing to teach and stimulate these wisdom competencies in those 11 areas. And of course, it's been, it's been shown to work both individual and in group psychotherapy sessions. So, colleagues, in conclusion, given the importance that this disorder may have, especially after conflicts at work, what we're seeing now, moral distress in the COVID period with the workforce, medical workforce and so forth. Redundancy, dismissal, unemployment. There must be an increased awareness of resilience enhancement in the workplace. Organizational psychological medicine based interventions based on neurosciences cognitive behavioral sciences and the underpinnings such as IIOPM program on valuing the human capital for healthcare workforce, education workforce, cooperation, corporate executives. This together with wisdom competency therapy offer evidence-based interventions for the workforce in dealing with this embitterment and the related post-traumatic embitterment disorder. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Razal, for a wonderful and stimulating talk. And um, certainly you have addressed one important area that is uh, very relevant in the current uh, workforce in any organization, and also for sharing some of your insights and possible solutions into this important topic. I request all the participants to reserve any questions uh, for dis Professor Disouza for the discussion, uh, maybe after one hour. So the, uh, I'll move on to the next topic. And our next speaker is Tony Getty, who is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Chesterfield Park Hospital in Doncaster, United Kingdom. And today he's going to talk about a very important topic on what are the positive lessons for the leaders for the COVID crisis. Before I ask him to talk about this, very brief introduction about Tony. Tony graduated with a degree in marketing before becoming a chartered accountant with KPMG in London. He subsequently um, went on to uh, pursue a diverse career, um, turning around underperforming organizations uh, in various sectors as diverse as food and drink, hotels, electronics, and retail. And he has run organizations with operations in most Western European countries, uh, Hong Kong, ta Taiwan, and China as well. In 2013, he started to work in healthcare sector and uh, he became chief executive of Chesterfield Park Hospital in 2017. He served as a non-executive director in various uh, industries and sectors, including jointly, heavy engineering business and property. Tony is very passionate with what he does, and recently he has written back to studying in his downtime after 33 years, and this time in the field of molecular biology. And uh, he has taken some time off recently to go and study this field, and I wish him good luck with that. But coming back to the presentation today, I think when the crisis has hit, um, just like any other organization, even Chesterfield Park, um, we're grappling with various um, um, doubts in terms of how to 
uh, deal with this crisis. And today, Tony's presentation explores, in particular, whether COVID-19 pandemic amounted to a different form of crisis from a management perspective, and what are the positive lessons that were learned around management styles, and also importantly, if these lessons point to an evolution in the skill sets that the managers need to keep staff engaged in the post-COVID world. He clearly explained to me that this is not an academic research article or presentation, and this is based on his own personal experiences and observations that might stimulate some reflection for many of us um, listening and joining us in this conference. I think I have seen him in action in terms of um, post-COVID or during the COVID crisis. And certainly, um, I would say that the visible and compassionate leadership has resulted in significant difference in terms of how individuals and the workforce felt valued and empowered. And I think it will be very important to understand some of his insights and um, um, from his uh, talk today. So over to you, Tony, to talk about the topic on positive lessons for the leaders for the from the COVID crisis. Well, good morning. Um, uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, uh, depending on which part of the world you're in. Um, uh, thank you very much, uh, particularly to uh, Professors uh, Nimagad and D'Souza and Tandon for the, the kind invite. Um, as uh, Shukans has explained, um, uh, I, I, my, my topic today really falls into kind of two parts. Uh, firstly, is the COVID crisis a different kind of management crisis? And secondly, are there positive lessons that leaders can learn from the crisis? Um, if, if we go back to early 2020, government and health leaders struggled to react to the emerging pandemic. Um, and the atmosphere, uh, I would say, got characterized perhaps a little too much by a bit too much fear uh, and little at that stage recognized um, expert knowledge that provided clarity of leadership. Uh, and the extreme isolationist approach adopted in the first lockdowns, uh, it, uh, certainly in Europe in the spring, arrives relatively suddenly and impacted every person, every business, and I think every work, work, workplace. And, and apart from wars, none of us really expected that something as innocuous as a tiny virus um, might bring a lot of the world to its knees. So in the spring of 2020, no one knew the size of the cliff we were facing. Uh, but as we end 2020, I think good leaders will be considering if they can incorporate any of the positive aspects of our experiences in the pandemic into future working methodologies. So an initial fear of the kind of unknown and the general media hype um, tended to focus on all the negative experiences and we'll all be familiar with them. The, the chart runs through a whole series of them. A large number of, of people experienced personal hardships, um, ranging from the extremes of deaths of family members and relatives, uh, 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 missed funerals, the inability to attend funerals, the ability to comfort a dying relative, uh, delayed, delayed investigations or treatment indeed for other often serious health conditions. Um, uh, perhaps personal illness themselves, uh, perhaps some, some people have ended up suffering from long COVID, or, or many of us ended up with the simpler negatives around things like uh, restrictions on shopping and dining out and meeting with friends, um, uh, being forced to work from home, uh, restrictions on travel or holidays, but um, uh, and in some cases maybe consequences writing out of businesses finally they had to restructure as a consequence of the pandemic uh, and that may for some have resulted in unemployment and for some will undoubtedly result in unemployment in the months and perhaps a year to come uh, and a lot of these have impacted individuals mental health uh, and even though I, I talk from a mental health hospital I'm not going to address the mental health aspect of of any of these kind of negatives today um, but finding positives 
uh, despite this long list of negatives, I, I think is actually quite an important thing to do. And indeed, for those people who've suffered badly, the fact there might be some positives that come out of it may, may help them deal with their own grief and their own issues. So, so leaders of organizations, big and small, were, th were thrust unexpectedly into what many believed was a, a once in a lifetime crisis as the pandemic gathered pace. So, so as leaders, was managing the crisis comparable to managing other forms of crisis? Um, uh, traditional management training will speak of, of two types of crisis, uh, crisis arising from known risks and crises arising out of failure. So, so crises from known risks, things like um, uh, IT systems attack, uh, uh, fire, perhaps loss of a key component in a production business. These can largely be planned for and rehearsed for. And crisis arising out of failure, uh, product recalls, uh, 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 major failure in the service provision, uh, uh, um, a major uh, PR disaster of some kind, um, even a financial performance issue that might result in a turnaround. These types of crisis of failure are much more challenging and much more emotional for those involved. And they usually demand uh, what I would call singularity of purpose, often an autocratic leadership style during the round, around implementation of actions and often result in job losses for at least some of the employees in the organization. But the COVID crisis was different. Um, it wasn't a recognized risk. It, it had largely not been foreseen uh, and it didn't arise out of failure on the part of most organizations and are arguably failure on the part of governments. There was no proven response to be drawn upon from prior crises. This was a truly novel event. Um, the public had absolutely no idea what to expect, it brought fear, anxiety, loneliness. Um, indeed, in some parts of the world, early, early stage signs of, of public panic and and perhaps but for governments printing money to support keeping people in employment, it would have brought, a, a, brought around a much more sudden increase in unemployment and then possibly civil unrest. So I, I'm gonna class this type of crisis as a humanitarian crisis affecting workplaces. I see it as quite a different type of crisis from the two classic ones. Um, but, but we all tend to regard humanitarian crisis, certainly in Western Europe, as something that, that happens um, in poorer parts of the world. But this time, this humanitarian crisis was not happening in Africa or in some faraway place. It was right in our own homes, in our own streets, in every single one of our workplaces in our place of leisure and in the places where we socialized. And it affects our family members, our neighbors, our friends, and all of our work colleagues. This time, everyone was impacted, um, all of our staff and all, of their, and all of their families, and everyone needed answers. Every leader needed answers, and everyone looked to the leaders for some answers and some certainty. Um, everyone needed leaders they could trust. So, so really, what were the leadership skills? Were they different too from the skills one normally has in the classic definition of, of crisis management? Um, under the traditional models of, of leadership and crisis, leaders are expected to show resilience, calmness, control, um, high energy, uh, vision, uh, certainty about the actions they're taking so, that, so they uh, uh, so security with, with uh, employees, the ability to make fast decisions uh, and deliver a resolution that limits long-term damage to an organization. The, the rollout of disaster recovery plans or the implementation of turnarounds or crisis of failure techniques. Uh, our skills required, um, uh, are, 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 are the skills required for those are very well known and they're widely studied on curricula in uh, management schools. But the traditional management models and techniques didn't cover the, this third form of crisis sufficiently well, a, a humanitarian crisis affecting all of our workplaces. One needed more than the traditionally recognized skills of vision and high energy and certainty of actions, etc. So in contrast to the uh, it constitutes the styles that are required in traditional crisis. 
this humanitarian crisis really required leaders with soft skills around people, with the ability to empathize and support, with skills to engage uh, people in the decision-making process. That's not something you normally would do in, in a crisis management scenario. Um, skills around first-class communication, uh, but also being able to manage both the short-term immediate actions um, plus keeping an eye on the long-term implications and responses that uh, may be required. And I don't mean people skills that are about the art of persuasion. Uh, I mean people skills that are around uh, listening, adapting and supporting people. Uh, these are in many respects very different skills from those needed in what we class as, a, as the traditional crisis management scenarios. So perhaps let's look more closely at the application of these skills that proved helpful in responding to, to this humanitarian crisis affecting our workplace, workplaces and, and explore if, if these skills may prove beneficial to the workplace in the longer term. So what were the practical steps uh, we took here in this one organization during the initial um, uh, wave? Um, uh, my personal, um, experience obviously is, is in an organization that wasn't going to be closed down during furlough. It's a hospital. Rather, we were expected not to stay at home, but to go to work uh, and look after patients, some of whom would inevitably contract uh, COVID-19. At this time, there was absolutely no reference book to follow that contained all the steps uh, one should take it as a manager in terms of responding to this type of crisis. Um, I, I think we found that gathering together groups of staff with knowledge on things like infection control, the estates management, you know, the physical uh, aspects of the buildings, um, HR, uh, psychology to provide support for staff meant we could discuss options and largely agree on what appeared sensible steps. And that kept a lot of people involved in the decision making, very different to a classic crisis and meant more people, I think, supported the restrictions impl implemented than might have been if they'd been autocratically issued. Um, we, we set up separate operational and ethical groups. The operational teams considered um, uh, things like the continually changing guidance, which certainly the UK changed incredibly frequently. Um, uh, things like infection control, staff isolation rules dealt with absence from work management of staffing who could come in environmental changes etc whilst the ethics group which indeed was was um, headed up by professor nimagada uh, looked largely at the basis of how we would might make some of the very tough decisions if we reached a point where we had limited resources and more demand than we had the resources available to to cope with um, with the demand for patients we certainly found uh, daily briefings to staff representatives from every single ward helped cascade information back into our wards and back through the organization and that also provided me with the opportunity to listen to questions that staff asked at those briefings good barometer a uh, good touchstone to allow one to feel the issues that bothered people in the organization rather than the issues at the top you might think people were concerned about um, and, and I'd say an important component of that is being extremely honest. If you don't know the answer, tell them. Um, uh, don't try and make something up. Most staff will see through it. You damage your credibility. You damage the leadership ability of the organization to run through. Um, we certainly found a series of written briefings uh, covering all the things covered in the daily verbal briefings meant every member of staff had, had personal emails from the senior leadership team. I think we wrote 32 uh, COVID-19 uh, updates to our staff uh, in the first 12 weeks of the spring uh, lockdown. So, yeah, that's not far off uh, uh, three a week. Uh, so there was a huge effort to almost over communicate in this crisis. Visibility, Professor Nimagata mentioned it earlier on. Leaders need to be seen, um, can't hide away. Um, uh, in, in this instance, the easy option would have been for the leaders to work from home, um, but, they, but they need to be seen to be fully present and fully engaged. Um, tone, tone very important, uh, one around engagement with staff, listening, 
hearing, supporting, honesty, kindness, caring. The, these registered, all these um, uh, attributes registered with, and I think provided reassurance for staff. Uh, one of the other things we found ourselves doing quite a lot was continually thanking staff for some of the, the amazing feats of heroism we saw. Um, and also providing hope for staff with some real optimism about um, the future. That helps staff feel that their leaders meant well and that their leaders were trying to aim to do things that help the employees at the centre um, of, of plans. Uh, and clearly with the regard to the use of, of technology, the rapid rollout of, of laptops for staff and, and perhaps more importantly, the rollout of Wi-Fi video comms for all patients, um, and their families brought brought some real benefits at a time when patients couldn't see families and and vice versa. But most of all, bringing humanity to the leadership role was absolutely key in my views. Sensitivity, not blaming those who couldn't cope with the crisis, and there were some. Support for staff, including psychology support, very important. Um, hotel accommodation, we provided um, uh, our staff with the ability to stay if they if their family circumstance allowed it uh, to stay in a local hotel and not run any risks of taking a virus home or indeed bringing a virus in. Uh, free meals at work, um, I, I'm gonna call them individual acts of kindness. We put in things like wobble rooms. Um, all of these went a long way uh, towards my own learnings of the importance of looking after staff when, when actually they also were in a crisis. It wasn't the organization that was in a crisis every single one of us had a mini crisis in our own private lives um, and in those circumstances humanity i think is absolutely key so fundamentally making one staff feel that the organization really cared about them was absolutely essential um, so, so on the back of those kind of measures and i'm, I'm sure other organizations found um, uh, alternative measures some will have a better ones um, some perhaps didn't do quite so well. How, how did our staff respond? Um, so I, it, in my own organization, um, despite it being a hospital, there was absolute initial fear of a largely unknown virus that, that the media reminded all of us was likely to bring death to those like, even exposed to it for short periods of time. Uh, and that initial fear was largely superseded, I would say within 48 hours uh, uh, by staff who, who ended up with a real resolve and a can-do attitude. And this was largely due to the employees' values, um, which, which reinforced for most of them um, that their patients took priority over their personal worries. But it's also fair to say that it, uh, it was helped enormously. In fact, it's essential um, that staff began to feel that their absolute focus, that the absolute focus the organization put on infection control and the provision of appropriate PPE mitigated their personal risk. And, the, and these factors are, were key to staff feeling uh, safe um, uh, and being able to do what they felt was the right thing in, in terms of turning up and dealing with, with ill patients. Um, and in many instances for our families, that meant staying away from their own families um, where that was possible. Uh, and our experience in the hospital um, in the spring wave, we had 16 patients who caught the virus. Uh, thankfully, we only had one who required uh, long-term uh, ventilation and intervention. On our worst day, we had 50% of our staff um, uh, either ill or uh, shielding, but uh, unable to turn up for work. And that placed real strain on the staff who came uh, on duty that day. Um, and it was a day uh, it was a day that um, indeed I was in other wards and um, in normal events uh, the amount of complaints one would have received would have would have deafened one but in these situations I didn't see one complaint uh, I didn't hear anyone do anything other than roll their sleeves up and get on with it uh, many more of our staff contracted the virus than patients got the virus um, uh, four of them became extremely unwell uh, thankfully, they've all recovered, although a couple of them have, have long COVID. Um, um, 
But, but despite the fear, I, I witnessed amazing levels of commitment and kindness, care, tenderness towards others and passion about their work. Um, and as a leader, that's incredibly humbling. Uh, the reaction from most frontline staff reminded me that organizations are really only as good and as strong as the values they practice and, uh, and as good and as strong as the people at the front line delivering the care. Uh, it, certainly in our organization, the immediate crisis had the benefit of focusing absolutely everyone on one simple, single issue, uh, defeating, of the, defeating the virus. Um, all other issues in the organization just melted into the shadows as absolutely everyone focused on survival and doing the right thing. But the trust in the leadership was palpable and the organization received amazingly um, more complaints, uh, sorry, more compliments from our staff in the 10 plus weeks of the initial lockdown than we've ever done previously. Um, and that's not something that you'd normally find in a crisis. <laughs> and normally you end a crisis with a fairly large entry of complaints rather than compliments. And, and, and staff reported that their sense of achievement, their job satisfaction increased as progress against COVID-19 uh, demonstrably at, 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 with patients showed improvements demonstrably faster than we often experience with uh, recovery from some of the severe mental illnesses that we'll have with patients who, who can be with us for a couple of years. Um, uh, staff also reported that morale improved as I felt they were winning the battle. Um, uh, and while such improvements in in healthcare settings may not be readily transferable uh, to mainstream industries or indeed service organizations, staff morale in most organizations can still benefit once your staff feel the organization is adapting and surviving a crisis. That sense of shared survival uh, can create a real sense of achievement against the odds, but leaders need to garner that message properly. So apart from how our staff reacted and the positives we got out of that, how did the public react? You know, what, pos what positives did, can we pick from the public reaction? There are plenty of negative reactions in the public, but there were huge amounts of positivity. You know, in the immediacy of the, of the response to the crisis, we saw at what I'm going to class as the re-emergence of some of the perhaps old fashioned values, yeah, caring for neighbors, um, some newfound respect for those working in frontline roles. And I, I don't just mean emergency frontline healthcare roles. I, I mean, a new respect for delivery drivers, for supermarket workers, uh, for care home staff, people who were expected to go to work when most of the rest of the world were at home. We also have found a, a new appreciation of cleanliness and a better awareness of how easily infections are spread. And that may pay dividends in the future in terms of other infections that we get regularly or, or non-cyclically. Uh, and perhaps for many people, the words infection control now resonates with them, whereas at a time, yeah, people saw that as, as something that was not relevant to them. Uh, certainly there's a new appreciation of, of hugging, the kind of missed hug. It's interesting how the public have reacted to that. Um, I, I would say appreciation emerged for simple things in life. Yeah, a trip to the park, certainly in the UK, became a treasured experience. And it created a memory that previously we just wouldn't have given a second thought to. Uh, perhaps most of us wouldn't have even gone to the park. It was amazing how simple things uh, became momentous and memorable. Um, and working from home for most of us became possible all of a sudden. <laughs> um, yeah, we found, yeah, in the environment, wildlife bloomed, uh, toxic gases reduced over huge chunks of the industrialized world. And in many ways, simple became fashionable about, again, you know, simple values, simple outings, simple working arrangements. So, so how do we keep the positive things that we found both inside an organization and the positive things maybe that... Um, alive and incorporate them into our workplaces going forward. Um, I, I said earlier that leaders of organizations, big and small, were thrust unexpectedly into this crisis in the spring. And, and whether it turns out to be a once in a lifetime event or indeed 
a repetitive feature of life for us from here on. Leaders should reflect on what they did during the crisis and what lessons there might be for the way we work and how our workplaces, future workplaces and our leisure time and our general appreciation of life may change. Um, your good leaders now have the opportunity to adapt their organizations to ones which genuinely and demonstrably value their staff. Um, and I, and I think that I, I class that as a fundamental principle of bringing kindness to your staff, to your workforce, and um, bring it into your organization's cultures, its decision making, and most importantly, into its actions, because that's how our staff measures. Ensuring the team you work with understands the benefits of being kind to your staff, and they have the personal skills to implement those changes, that change in tone and that change in action is one of the first challenges for any leader. You know, allowing staff to perhaps organize themselves, their work, um, uh, uh, to work uh, more flexibly, to suit uh, themselves or their families or outside commitments, so their life are better balanced. Flexibility in, in when and where and how people work. But, but you have to absolutely ensure they're accessible by video, not just by phone by video so that those who are at the front line or who are still in your office or still on your production line can see that those who are working from home are actually working and are engaged and are fully accessible during the hours in which they're supposed to be there. Um, I, I think organizations also need to think about recognizing that, that employees have family needs um, and certainly in too much of the Western world pre-crisis, we tended to, not to think about families in the same balanced way that perhaps the, the COVID crisis has forced many of us to reconsider. So, so offering a work-life balance that enhances people's lives and values their families, well worth considering. Um, encouraging staff to, to take their rest, get outdoors, take leisure time, and spend less time in the office, but be just as effective whilst they're at work is perhaps one of the good outcomes we could have from this. And, and valuing your staff in the workplace, you know, you know, recognizing, encouraging, valuing your staff for the work they do outside work. Um, that might just help with the humanity that we should be showing to staff, that we value them uh, for, what they, for what they do both outside and inside the organization. So, you know, are any of, any of us brave enough at our management meetings to be, have our colleagues tell us about, um, uh things they've done outside work in the last week their trip to the park um yeah something they've been reading something they made yeah something they did for other people but something that brings a life for all of us in the workplace the fact that people have much broader lives and we need to encourage that and find that a better balance so adopting a supportive approach and, and tone towards your staff fundamentally a change in the tone and culture in which we operate now, none of that means that uh, the employees will run your organization or that a union takes advantage of you being more accommodating towards your staff. And, and, and neither does it mean that you can't say no. You can still say no, and there are ways of saying no, whilst explaining and communicating why it's a no. So you ensure that the staff understand that they have been heard, um, even if the answer is the answer they'd like just now. But non-personal leadership really needs to be a thing of the past. One of the big challenges will be modeling how to deal with people positively. So managers at every level in an organization gain the skills to act out the values in daily decision-making and interactions with staff. Um, so, so, so perhaps beginning to incorporate some of them um, if if you've overlooked the increasing importance of, of softer leadership skills in your organization, you might now consider starting by genuinely reviewing how you handled the COVID crisis, what you got right and what you got wrong. Um, ask your staff, get them involved, um, ask them to tell you how they feel the organization did. And it's always easy to see in hindsight, um, but, but maybe acknowledging to your staff that some elements of it you got wrong is a really helpful way of resetting the tone in your organization. Um, another challenge will undoubtedly be getting your HR team um, uh, to model 
softer values and when all of their training is about protecting the organization almost from its staff it's a sad reflection on human resource management in modern organizations that they're a big part of their function is to protect the company from its staff rather than to enhance uh, the well-being of staff within the organization um, uh, however we must also be mindful that there remains something of a paradox around the increasing application of technology in our working lives yeah undoubtedly technology can bring us the benefits of flexibility to working hours reduce travel time <laughs> perhaps reduce the amount of office space we need and the rents we pay. Um, it'll undoubtedly impact on the design of offices and workplaces in the future, but technology without humanity risks staff losing their identity as part of an organization. Uh, em employees uh, who only ever get together, even by video link, um, uh, rather than phone calls, will it, employees who never get together even if they only do it by video link, they will begin to feel alone over time. Uh, and the lack of small talk about pastimes and families and activities will gradually erode the unconscious bonds we have for those we work with. You know, we're all familiar with the research that, that tells us that people stay with organizations in the end, not, not just for money, um, but often for the people you work with and the enjoyment you get from sharing time with those people um, uh, and all of that could be undermined if, if employees never have the opportunity for social engagement around their work and an organization's risk ultimately finding that teams are not as robust if we were to permanently um, switch some to a home-based working model um, the human factor just cannot be ignored simply because technology is capable of connecting us. It can only connect us at one level, technology can, but, but technology alone cannot bridge the social aspects that teams bring and teams need and that sense of belonging, that team pride, the supportive uh, systems that one has around you within an organization. So, so by all means, we need to embrace technology to improve flexibility for employees and to provide them with better work-life balances. But we have to find ways to keep bringing people together physically in the workplace from time to time to engender the organization's values, its, its spirit, its sense of community. So use technology, but, but put what I would call a layer of sociability or humanity around that technology to ensure your organization's spirit remains bonded and robust. If, if nothing else, this epidemic has shown us that technology can be adapted, uh, ad ad adopted rapidly in organizations, but the organizations that came out of this crisis best from what I've seen were those that were inclusive and they kept their communications with and the support for their people central to their thinking. Um, I, I would argue that if you ignore the human aspect um, of, an, of engaging and supporting your workforce in the long term for all the other positives that are possible out of this crisis, they will be undermined um, if we make our workplaces less human. So, so the big lesson for me is that leaders need to bring more humanity to organizations. And perhaps that's not a great big surprise in a in a humanitarian crisis that's affecting most of our workplaces, that the response is fundamentally about bringing humanity to deal with that. Um, and I, I've listed on the slide all, you know, some of the attributes you might, you might want. Um, so in addition to the kind of all the classical leadership skills one's needed in crisis till now, I, I think you need to add an, a, another key attribute, which is being kind to your staff. Um, I, I believe your staff turnover, their involvement in your organization, their feelings of being heard, looked after, their loyalty, their willingness to really put the effort in when the chips are down, help you solve problems will improve. And, and you'll end up with a happier and a more caring and indeed more loyal workforce. So these represent a major challenge for most organizations, but healthcare should be able to lead the way in all of this. Um, so, um, uh, there are my observations and our experience in this particular hospital. Um, so for all of your time, I, I hope uh, 
Uh, I hope some of that will provide people with um, some thought uh, and perhaps uh, uh, some people who are in attendance who have better minds than mine can put um, a psycholo like psychological models behind some of this experience. But I'd just like to say thanks very much and thanks for asking me to, um, to attend. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, for a thought-provoking talk and also sharing your insights. And I'm sure this will stimulate some discussion and reflection from the audience. And uh, please stay with us so that you can take some questions in the discussion shortly. Okay, I move on to the next uh, speaker. We have uh, Professor Subodh Dave joining us uh, to talk on caring about healthcare professionals during COVID-19 crisis. He will talk about uh, risk assessments and well-being initiatives. And uh, very briefly about uh, uh, Professor Dave. I've known him for a number of years, and um, he has been various forums, including um, Royal College of Psychiatrists. He's currently the Associate Dean of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. He's a professor of psychiatry from University of uh, Bolton. He's a chair of the Association of University Teachers of Psychiatry, and he's also chair, vice chair of BAPU, Institute of Health Research. Subodh, Subodh has been very keen on promoting community enhancement to enable the delivery of person-centered care. And in particular, he has collated the development of the college report, CR215, on person-centered care. He is very passionate about medical education and also uh, patient improvement and quality improvement um, over the years. He's, uh, he has published a famous book, undergraduate text textbook on 100 cases in psychiatry, and he has lectured extensively on the subject of uh, medical education, global mental health, and also values and, and ethics. So currently, he is a dean for trainee support at the Royal College of Psychiatry, and he has developed internationally acclaimed early support and mentoring programs for international medical graduates. Subodh is a, is, a, is a keen runner and he has run several marathons over the years. And to his credit, he has recently run Berlin Marathon in three hours. And much more recently, he has cycled, cycled across United Kingdom in 10 days and he has raised funds for doctors in distress and also raised awareness about mental illness and suicides in doctors. So I, the topic that he's talking today is very relevant, not only for healthcare professionals, but also for any employees in other organizations. So we'll hear from Professor Dave. Over to you, Subodh. Thank you so much, Sikhan, for that kind introduction. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, as you said quite rightly right at the end, that though um, I'm focusing on healthcare professionals, actually, uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is relevant to all organizations, and and uh, um, in fact, I mean, in many ways, I, I've been I've been striving hard to kind of uh, to remove the distinction of us and them, and I think which kind of creeps up a lot of the times that we talk about about health professionals and and the general population. There are there are certain uh, differences, and I'll touch upon them when we when we get there. But uh, in general, I think we share a lot of characteristics with our with our, the population that we serve. So I'm going to focus on these three things. Um, I think uh, I'm going to touch upon the, 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 the devastating impact that COVID has had, uh, but also talk about how COVID has essentially amplified the risks that have already pre-existed in the population and how we should all be aware of them. Uh, and, and then I'm going to touch upon what are the things that we can do going in the future, thinking particularly uh, of proactive uh, risk assessments. So I'm, I'm sure everybody knows about uh, the whole story. This is with the word unprecedented is used so commonly generally. And then this word has hit us this year. And and in a way, I think, uh, Tony, your talk was very enlightening because it, it is it is so, so true that in many ways, this has been very strange, very surreal. And yet in, in some strange ways, we've all just carried on, you know, and that is and that dichotomy of, of having to carry on, carrying on with a normal life feeling almost normal, and yet the world around you is completely topsy-turvy. And, and um, so it's been really a strange time. And um, I'm sure all of us have got personal stories of how this has affected us or people very close to us. So um, 
but the human cost has been has been massive. We all know that that um, uh, the number of deaths have just been steadily climbing, and and certainly here in the United Kingdom also we've been left um, quite devastated. I think at the start um, it was our, our CMO said, the chief medical officer said that if we keep the death toll at twenty thousand, we'll have done well, and now it's nearly three times that already. And the end doesn't yet seem in sight. I mean, with the, even with the promise of vaccines, et cetera, we, we know it all seems kind of still far away. And then that in itself, the fact that there is no clear end in sight also plays in your mind. And I think um, that's a big factor. But just giving you a little brief snapshot of what has been the picture in the UK, United Kingdom particularly, I know this is an international talk and a global audience, but uh, maybe some of the issues are relevant here. And I think um, it will, particularly given the fact that we will be touching upon uh, uh, inequalities. And so the NHS is, is, is one of the largest employers in the world. So it's, it's the fifth largest employer in the world. And, and also one of the largest employers of, of a migratory workforce. So we, we employ the, the large, one of the largest numbers of international healthcare uh, workforce anywhere in the world. And that in itself has a huge impact on how to manage things. And I, I have been arguing for some time that the NHS, despite being an employer of an international health workforce hasn't really given adequate thought of how do you manage the diversity of workforce that you have and how do you plan your induction in advance how do you proactively manage an acculturation of the diverse workforce into the into the healthcare system and i think um, that is something that people are waking up to now but uh, but you know i think there has been a tendency of of importing labor and then putting them in the deep end without there being any adequate support and that has consequences. And unfortunately this year, the consequence has been, has been very tragic. You know, I think um, I'm sure most of you have seen the amnesty report, uh, which was published in September this year, uh, UK 649 deaths. And, and, and this has left many people wondering that how come, how come a developed nation, one of the richest nations in the world in the top six, uh, uh, highest GDP, one of the highest GDP figures in the world, part of G7, is also ending up as the third highest reported death figure of, of healthcare professionals. How did that happen? And I, this is a separate talk, but I think I want to remind people that if the, of Kate Pickett's work, you know, and I think, uh, and uh, there's been a lot of work around this about polarization of wealth of countries. And you see that the countries that have more polarization of wealth, they have poorer health outcomes for everyone. And so certainly we see countries like US and UK, which have got significant polarization being outliers in terms of the overall health outcomes uh, and certainly for the healthcare professionals as well. And in a way that makes sense, right? I come from Mumbai originally. I think uh, some of you may, may know that. And so even if, even if you are a billionaire in, in Mumbai, your health outcome, I mean, you might have the be best healthcare facilities, the best uh, you know, uh, doctors. And we know that doctors from India are very, very good but still your health outcomes are likely to be poorer compared to uh, another less polarized nation. And the reason for that is, is simple, right? Say if you, if you have a, a, an emergency, even getting to that best hospital in the world might not be possible because you're the traffic jam and, and the roads are gridlocked. So, so when we think of inequalities, we have to think in, 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 in a holistic way. Uh, and I think the other speakers today have kind of touched upon that, that it's important to not view uh, health in a very, through a very narrow lens. And, and um, uh, unfortunately, it's been a difficult year. And for a lot of us, I think themes of grief and loss, which are, are in a way a reality for, for healthcare professionals generally, uh, it, has, it has hit home. I mean, I've lost four colleagues myself and, and perhaps many of you in, in, in the audience have, have lost people as well. And, and, and my condolences to all of us. But I think it, it brings home the reality that for healthcare professionals, um, this is a real issue. We have to think about this proactively. Um, I, I always give the analogy that you, we don't send anyone on a building site without a hard hat. Uh, certainly, you, you wouldn't see that in any developed nation. And, and I think more and more so across the world now that, that you can't enter a building site. And yet, I think if you look at healthcare professionals, generally doctors, nurses, OTs, people go into this training without actually being prepared for the job. And yet we all know that that themes of loss, um, themes of morbidity, mortality are something that we'll be facing all the time. 
And so just a, a brief snapshot of some of the services. Um, this was from, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And, and you can see that a, a significant number of us in the first line, you can see that a significant number of us had to, had to be redeployed and then change uh, uh, from the jobs that we were working. So there was a significant role shift. And I think that is quite important. I mean, in some ways, it, we were protected as healthcare professionals, weren't we? I think um, I certainly feel so because all throughout the lockdowns, I was actually able to go to work. I was, I'm a liaison psychiatrist now. And so though I did some work remotely, most of it was not possible. And so I actually had the opportunity to go out and lead a fairly normal life. More recently, uh, last month, I had to self-isolate for two weeks, and I really found it difficult. I found it difficult to be uh, stuck in my own house. And I think as healthcare professionals, sometimes we may, we, we may not really empathize with people who are stuck in a 20th floor apartment, you know, somewhere in a small apartment, maybe with two children and a dog. It, it, it's, it's, it has been difficult. In some way, the healthcare professionals were spared that. But on the other hand, um, you know, we as psychiatrists, I'm a psychiatrist and, and, and there are many psychiatrists in the room today, we tend to talk of one in four, uh, just to remind people that um, any one of us can be affected by mental illness. And then a lot of, uh, lot of celebrities have come out and talked openly about their illness, Stephen Fry in, in the UK, Deepika Padukone in India, and then there have been many, many celebrities. And yet I think we forget that actually for some people, the f one in four is not true. We know this, that, that you know, people who are come from deprived backgrounds who have traumatic uh, starts to their life, they all are more vulnerable, but also healthcare professionals. We are actually, for us, that one in four is, is a bit higher than one in four. It's more close to one in three. And COVID, I think, has shone a spotlight on that. So people who are already in that segment, COVID added that extra burden of stress and burnout that the rest of you were talking about today. And, and so that that was an add-on on top of what, what we already, already faced. And all of this doesn't mean that we need to be mollycoddled. It does mean that we require some proactive thinking. And I think is exactly the kind of work that IOPM is doing that, that, that needs that organizational uh, forethought to deal with that. And so there are a whole range of impact on professionals and, and, and a lot of you in the room would have experienced this that all of us in March were, were very worried about having the right kind of BP. Uh, we were being given conflicting advice. I know uh, personally, that some people were were admonished, you know, were sent memos by their managers. Why are you wearing a mask on, uh, at work? Uh, you are you are scaring our patients. Don't do that. And, and then three months later, they were being admonished. Well, why are you not wearing a mask? You know. So we all were given conflicting advice, and I think um, uh, different people have touched upon this moral injury. And I think that became a real issue for us. Right? Well, what do you do? I mean, you are coming back home. There are people you, you're living with family members, you're going to work, how do you keep them safe? How do you keep other people in, you come in contact with, uh, with them safe? Um, and, and, and also, you know, the moral injury of, of recognizing people, some people who had vulnerabilities and then thinking about, well, do I look after myself or do I put my patients first? And these were real issues and then they all have a consequence. Plus there was, uh, I mean, Tony, you touched upon technology, that technology was, uh, you know, we all had to make a sudden shift. In the UK, <clears throat> Microsoft Teams use uh, went up tenfold in a week, um, and and now there are a million meetings that are happening in the NHS on Microsoft Teams. And then we're all, I mean, you know, this is um, I've had a case, uh, a colleague of my, a friend of mine, got a case where somebody developed pressure sores, you know, because they were doing Zoom meetings all day long. So, so there are real consequences. I mean, we can all laugh at it, but I mean. It, it's been such a, such a sudden transformation that it, it's taken us a while to can adapt to that. And, and um, I don't think that all of us have managed that uh, work from home as, 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 as smoothly as we would have liked to. So a whole lot of pressures for us. And I think for certain groups, there were additional pressures. For trainees, I know they were very, very stressed about exams. Mm -hmm. And, and my medical students are really stressed about what will it do to their skills, core skills, because they're not getting the chance to go and operate. Or, or, and then for three, four months, they were completely away from any kind of uh, contact. Uh, so things are slowly returned to normal, but uh, there are real issues still. And in general, I think, uh, Russell, you touched upon this. This is occurring on top of the stress and burnout that people have already experiencing, and which is rising. So healthcare systems are complex. And more and more organizations are getting complex because we are seeing a lot of interfaces. There's a digital human interface. 
There's an interfaces between within the organizations and all interfaces potentially are friction points, right? And so unless those friction points are managed, then we are creating an avenue for burnout. And so that's what we've seen that, that a third of the healthcare workers who were already mentally Ill, Ill reported a worsening during COVID. And this is on top of the, the fact that um, uh, we know that pandemics in general make things worse for people. And I think uh, I've just put a slide there which showing psychological impact was worse for younger people or people who had dependents, especially children at home. And I know people really struggle trying to kind of, you know, be on, on a Zoom call while they have to also homeschool their children from home, et cetera. So there, are, there have been real challenges. And I don't think that we as a society have worked this out completely yet. And like I said, this is on top of what has already been reported. So in a way, this was not completely new. We knew from SARS pandemic, we knew even from Spanish flu pandemic, what, what, are, what to expect in some ways, but um, there wasn't really any preparation for this. Some of you may know Ananta Dave, she's uh, uh, my wife, uh, but she was um, appointed. And in the UK, I'm glad to say that all college psychiatrists took the initiative in appointing a task force very early on to, to look at the risk factors specifically for BAME populations, because it became very evident very early on that uh, as, as we received the deaths of the first 10 people, um, I, uh, Sri Srikant, you mentioned um, as a, um, vice chair of, of BAPU Institute of Health Research, we straight away launched a research project to assess the risk for, for BAME populations. And even our early findings showed this, that BAME populations, BAME healthcare workers were, were specifically feeling vulnerable and were feeling afraid to speak out. And the Royal College Psychiatrists decided to act on this uh, and they appointed a task force, which I was a member of, chaired by Ananta. And um, this report has had very good traction. It, it's, it's been nationally circulated by NHS employers, shared by BMA, it's been quoted in the parliament several times. And so I'm going to touch upon the fi key findings and the recommendations of the report uh, and weaving in with some of the other work that we've been doing. But just a background, I think one key thing to remember, and again, I talked about migration, and I think this is important because there hasn't been much talk about the global migration and how that affects stress. And I think there are, for healthcare workers, this is a specific issue because when you migrate, it's already a stressful experience. You're migrating from one country to another, one culture to another, uh, but there's also you're migrating from one medical jurisdiction to another. And that is a, a, a huge change. So. So there is very little to kind of, you know, the transit to make the transition very smooth. And unless you have supportive measures in place to make the transition smooth, you are going to see problems. And, and that's partly one of the things that I've been battling for. I think that, that we need those smoothening of transitions and then we need to institutionalize them. And unfortunately that doesn't exist. And just giving you the example of the UK, we, we save nearly a quarter of a million pounds or up to half a million pounds, depending on the senior, seniority of the doctor we import. And yet we invest zero pounds in actually providing an induction to them, zero pounds. Can you imagine? So there is not even a, 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 a token investment right at the beginning to see, well, you are coming to work in the NHS. How do we make sure that your, your, your induction in the NHS is smooth? And that then has consequences for people. It, it, it means that we end up seeing more uh, international healthcare workers uh, being referred to the GMC. We see more international healthcare workers actually suffering illness, reporting bullying, harassment, doing poorly in exams. And the difference is massive. International doctors generally, uh, their pass rates will be in the region of 30 to 40%. Uh, local graduates pass rates are in the region of 80 to 90%. So, so if you're not talking of minor differences, we're talking of mad, massive differences. And mind you, these are people who have been at the top of their game. The reason why they're migrating is because we had imported the creme de la creme. So, so, so this is not, this is not, the, uh, and studies have been done. So this can't be explained by prior attainment because prior attainment, they are le on level, but they start falling behind after they arrive, uh, after they, uh, they move countries. And unfortunately this year, uh, this has been a big issue. I think what has been lost in the, in the data from both US and UK and some other countries that BAME doctors uh, and BAME healthcare workers and BAME social care workers have died is the fact that international healthcare workers, irrespective of ethnicity, have also been disproportionately affected. So if you look at the UK, um, international healthcare workers make up about 30% to 25% of the, of, the, of the workforce. And if you look at the entire death rate, actually they are, it is double that, even if you include white ethnicity. And, and overall, 93% of the healthcare workers that ha had were not from the UK. 
So they were not, they were born outside the UK. So that's a big number. And, and so, and then unfortunately it doesn't appear in statistics because it's not a protected characteristic. So being a migrant is not a protected characteristic. Being black or uh, being, uh, you know, gay is, but uh, being a woman is, but being a migrant is not. And I think that's a significant stressor that we all need to be aware of. And so uh, I'll just go quickly to the, the task and finish group. So these are the key five areas in which the findings, and I want to share some of them. So the main learning I think is about uh, data. I think we do need data. And as I've touched upon the issue of migrants, I think this was raised in the parliament as well, that we didn't really have any concrete data. Again, registers have not been ma ma maintained very clearly. And I think data, HSJ has sourced data from newspaper reports, um, the health service journal in the UK. Uh, I think different countries have had different ways of, of monitoring this. And I think in many ways that is shocking. You know, I think we have to have a clear system to see uh, what happens at work-related deaths, right? I think, and that needs to be, that data needs to be available easily. And for healthcare and social workers, those regist registers are missing. And I would urge IIOPM to pick that issue up because that is one thing I think that needs to be done globally, that we really need a, a clear, transparent way of registering healthcare workers' deaths and, and recording uh, other data on their deaths about their ethnicity, about their migrant status, et cetera, because only that data will then help us to work out what's going on. Um, tailored risk assessments, I think, are very critical. I think uh, a lot of organizations came out with tick box assessments. We heard a lot about comorbid diabetes and obesity and all of that stuff. But we all know that that risk assessment, predicting risk of any kind, is 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 uh, you know is, is part astrology, part science. Uh, there is no tool that is very good. And 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 so uh, what the best approach we have is actually personalizing the approach. We need to use the evidence. We need to use the expertise of the person who's doing the risk assessment, but we also need to focus on the person who is being risk assessed to make sure that, that we are focusing on that person and that person's individual uh, factors. And clearly, I think I've seen a lot of my colleagues actually were finding the self-isolation that was imposed on them in the first lockdown extremely traumatic and which, which actually had a very negative impact on them. So I think we needed that personalized approach that can you come back to work uh, or with all the all the supports that you need, rather than just imposing that quarantine on you. And so I think when you see uh, the approach that the our task group took was about enabling a sensitive collaborative conversation, as you might expect from psychiatrists. This is what we wanted. We we didn't want a tick box. We wanted a a, a more personalized conversation, and we wanted to have a structured uh, plan that was collaboratively agreed that would then shape the way forward uh, and, and not have a tick box approach, not have a categorical yes, no tool, not a scoring checklist. And um, I have to say the, the feedback on this has been very, very positive. I think uh, employers across the country have used it. In fact, a lot of employers have approached um, even, even non-healthcare, like you said, and, and, and they found it helpful. <clears throat> and so I think, like I've already said, I think um, uh, one of the key things that we have to, when we think about personalized uh, thing is is the othering issue. And I think uh, this may be relevant to all organizations here because when you have an assessor and you have an assessee, I think there's already a little bit of a power differential. And I think that needs to be borne in mind. And I think it's for the assessor to kind of reflect upon how to reduce that power differential and how to, how to make sure that there is a, a collaborative discussion. And also to think about other factors that might be causing that othering. And I think sometimes it's easy to forget, uh, to be blind to our privilege, right? So I think if you are a senior manager, you, you might forget what does a, a, a healthcare assistant feel when they actually sit in the same room with you. And I think it, it, it's for us to be sensitive to that. Similarly, if you are a white senior manager, it might be easy to forget that how, how might a, a black colleague actually feel uh, uh, sitting in the same room with you. The, the, their perspective of being in the room might be slightly different to yours. And I think it's just for us, important for us to kind of be mindful of those subtle, but I think which are very significant factors that can actually shape the way we carry out the risk assessment, what the outcome of that assessment might be. And so, like I said, we, clearly, I think we were trying to highlight the fact that international healthcare workers had a significant double jeopardy where ethnicity or other uh, issues were also coming into play. So, I mean, I'll just let you have a look at this slide. I mean, it's uh, repeating kind of some of the things that I've said, but but highlighting that that when we think about the individual uh, in question, there are a whole lot of contexts that we need to consider. And so 
I don't think that we need to go through this like a tick box, but if you have an open conversation, a lot of these things will come out. So what you don't want is saying that, well, let me ask you now about what is your role within the organization, or let me check out what is your organizational context. I, that that wouldn't work. I, th I think it's really about having a conversation saying, well, how has it been for you? What's going on? Tell me a little bit about your role. Tell me about what you do and tell me about how you've been feeling through this. And then what have you found helpful? What has not worked for you? What has made you anxious? What has en enhanced your anxieties? What has helped? And if you have that open conversation, then the person's strengths, their vulnerabilities, what uh, their physical health, mental health issues are, will all fall out of their conversation. And that is what we were trying to model uh, through our risk assessment. Um, and again, I think IIOPM I can could could play a role in this. I think you know I think it is, a simulation is always very helpful, and having some video based resources that people could look at uh, that that model these uh, conversations, uh, supportive conversations is is always helpful in my opinion. I think we've um, uh, um, you mentioned uh, Srikant that I'm an educator, and I think we've done a lot of work around simulation and using actors uh, and even forum theater kind of workshops, and they've been very successful. But one of the things that we really found helpful, uh, uh, touching upon the issue of privilege that we talked about, so we we actually looked at the evidence to to, to share with uh, uh, with people what we already know about discrimination, about power differentials, and then saying that what has what how has COVID amplified that that risk. So, for example, we know know from in, in this is a UK setting, but again, I think a lot of these findings are general. That we know that if you already experience discrimination, you are less likely to report it because you are already feeling disempowered. And so, in the context of COVID, uh, this became very evident when we did our first survey through BAPIO, which was published, uh, that uh, people from BAME background were less likely to actually report uh, inadequate PPE. In my own case. For uh, four months, I used disposable, uh, uh, you know, scrubs and just used them, washed them at home in my washing machine and reused them because the scrubs weren't available. And, and, and uh, you know, even I didn't really feel uh, empowered enough, I think, or not empowered, maybe strong, but I think maybe it didn't. I just, I, I think that was another thing that it wasn't just the issue of empowerment. It's also the issue of your ethos and ethic. I think BAME people kind of felt that I need to get on with work. And I think a lot of them kind of just did that. They didn't really feel able to raise some issues. And so it's important to kind of be aware of that. Uh, we know that, that <clears throat> certain groups are more likely to face disciplinary proceedings, uh, formal proceedings, and, and dealt with formally rather than informal means. And I think that again, uh, shapes their behavior. <clears throat> And in general, they might have fewer role models. So, so that's again, something that can, that can uh, uh, impact on their behavior. And, and we knew that um, uh, increased anxiety, stress, isolation, less confidence to ask questions then has a multiplying effect because then that uh, impacts on the way they interact with their colleagues in that the way they engage with the risk assessments. There's a sense of cynicism that develops about uh, organizational leadership and about the, the broader government, et cetera. And so that's something that we needed to be aware of. And so I think for thinking specifically about BAME groups and international healthcare workers, I think uh, we, we, we tried to provide a tool there. We, we said that again, focus on the basics, make sure they've had that. We know they are at higher risk. Uh, and then this was multiplying as, as we moved from March to April, May, June. Unfortunately, the numbers of people from BAME groups dying, both within the population and healthcare workers, was significant. They were significantly overrepresented, so it became a, a national, well, international crisis because the similar findings were coming across from many other countries as well. And then, so we needed something urgently, and I think so we uh, we, we really focused on this work and got this out fairly quickly. But it was all very practical advice. It was thinking about because a lot of organizations, for example, were creating rotors out of hours that would have involved face-to-face -face contact with patients. And then they were putting people in uh, a, a particular grade of people not recognizing. So in the, in the UK context, the, the staff grade and associate specialist grades were asked to man those rotors. And, and, and those 80% uh, of people on those rotors were from BAME background. So though that was not something that you might have thought of, it was inadvertently creating a situation which would enhance that discrimination and, and, and the risk that we were already facing. So I think we were just basically asking at board level, at the highest level for people to think about every step that they took in their policies and actions and thinking, creating that lens so that they could actually see that 
that the equality lens to make sure that everybody was uh, receiving um, the kind of support from the organization that would make sure that the safety and and uh, you know effectiveness of care that they were getting was um, was was equal. And so, um, well-being and support. I think um, again, it, the our focus was to make sure that work is personally meaningful and fulfilling. Uh, I think a lot of people, it wasn't a question of, you know, wanting to, I think people who were excluding felt really excluded and, and to try and see how they could be involved in work, even from working from home and, and to make reasonable adjustments. And so um, I think there were a whole lot of support measures that we launched. I, I've been doing a lot of talks across the country, um, helping people with simple things. I think so one of the things we've been asking people to do is in the wake of COVID is to make sure that they were recognizing their emotions. And I think within teams, I think when COVID interfered, I think it caused a lot of en enhancement of stress. And I think even a simple thing, uh, I think it, it was quite easy for people to get into a mode where they were not able to put a, put a pulse on what exactly they were feeling. So actually labeling an emotion helps because then that reduces secondary anxiety. So uh, there, were, there were programs and workshops that we were leading around this helping people to identify their triggers. Uh, uh, we saw a significant spike in anxiety, almost uh, PTSD-like symptoms. Uh, I think we certainly saw a lot of symptoms around enhancement of uh, OCD-like symptoms and, and also PTSD-like symptoms uh, associated with moral injury and moral dilemma. I think that became quite common. And, and again, helping people to recognize what was triggering those was 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 helpful. So we've been doing workshops, helping people to think about their emotional triggers, their cognitive triggers, physical triggers, and action triggers. Simple advice around management of inf uh, information overload. I think we all must be getting this. I, I cannot imagine that NHS is the only organization that has done this. Every organization must be sending out emails from the CEO to the chief operating officer to your immediate line manager, and then you're getting national uh, televised addresses so we all were getting and then of course all of us also wanted to do our phds in covid on 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 whatsapp university so so there was that as well so i think um and then now again i think we all want to become the world's leading specialist on vaccines so so there is no no end to this right we all we all are getting source information overload so i really think that it's important that we prioritize information and then and, and think about what is actually needed to do our jobs uh, and then be quite ruthless about filtering the rest, you know, because uh, otherwise it's, it's difficult. And I think um, kindness has come in time and again in today's talks. Everybody's talked about it. And I think that's really important that we need to be uh, realistic and, and 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 set realistic goals. So I think I, I've seen a lot of people. I think in the first um, few weeks, I think when there was a relatively severe and stringent lockdown, that people were posting pictures of that of their sardo breads and uh, their dance routines. And it looked like that people were actually doing that. But then soon that other cognitive element that healthcare workers have, uh, that competitive health uh, streak they have took over. And then people said that, yeah, I started this, but it's all gone to pot now, I'm not doing anything. I signed up for a 10 week class and I only attended two. And I really feel that we need to be aware that, that we need to set realistic goals. I think the reality is that this has been a very busy period. And for some of us, it's been busier than normal because there's been additional workload. Um, and so I think recognizing that taking joy in the event itself, the fact that you made one bread, that is good enough. I mean, you, you don't need to become a professional baker. Uh, the fact that you did one dance routine, fantastic. You know, you don't need to kind of become a, 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 a X factor contestant or something. So I think I think learning how to be kind to ourselves and then being aware of our own sphere of influence was quite important, and we've been uh, emphasizing that. And lifestyle factors is key, and I think I think this has been touched upon briefly. But I think the number one factor, and I think it's forgotten sometimes, that you know we all been talking about anxiety, stress, depression, even psychosis, and uh, uh, but the number one factor that's been associated with COVID is insomnia, uh, both amongst healthcare workers. And, and in, in the general population. And both in uh, the pre-infection phase, so people who haven't been infected, I mean, and then we can we can associate with that, right? I mean, we've all been binging on Netflix shows and, uh, you know, box sets going through them. And so sleep-wake cycle has been all over the place. But also in during infection, so people who are infected and in the post-infection phase, insomnia is the number one uh, symptom. So percentages vary. So during infection, it's almost 50% of people who have insomnia. 
post infections about 20 to 25 percent but in, insomnia is the number one thing so i think we all need to be thinking about how do we improve that sleep cycle and uh, and there are lots of sleep apps available and um, those of you who haven't heard of the nhs uh, apps library do have a look i think i think that it's available um, it's accessible internationally as well uh, so if you if you google nhs apps library you should be able to see a whole range of apps and some of them are even free and certainly for healthcare workers in this country some of them are free uh, even if they were normally paid, uh, if you are an NHS worker. <clears throat> and so going back to this issue of, of being kind and being mindfulness, and I think I think this mindfulness bit is important. I mean, we, it, it's kind of thrown at everyone. And I think uh, I've had a lot of people say to me that if you tell me once more uh, to go to a mindfulness class or a do mindfulness thing, or I, I'm going to pull my hair out. And so I understand that. But I, 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 and I, and I don't feel that is the, a, the solution to mental illness, which a significant minority of us have experienced. So anxiety, stress, depression is real. And, and just going to a mindfulness class is not going to fix that. But equally, I think just getting that approach, even, as a, as a, as a, even just for a minute, I mean, I think we all do this, right? I'm sure many of you have been having your hot drinks or, you know, your drinks while you are actually on this webinar. And how is it just for us to just sip away that drink and not like realize what you've been drinking or, or whether you had a drink and, and, and it's finished by the time you kind of, you know, you haven't even focused on it. So just being holding the cup or what does the cup look like? What does it feel like? How hot is the drink? You know, what is the temperature? What is the taste? Um, I think introducing that little bit of variation in our lives so that we, start becoming more attentive and that that gift of attention is important right i think a part of that kindness and altruism is that gift of attention that when we actually talk to someone we actually listen to them and pay attention to them and and many people have said that that, that gift is is the most precious gift now I, I really feel that it's useful if we start uh, cultivating that especially in these times and so that has been part of our effort as well and I think it's really important that we know this, especially as healthcare workers. I, I'm astonished the number of times I've done workshops and people don't know where and how to seek help and also when to seek help. So I've been talking about, and we all have been talking about stress, burnout, and mental illness. And though they may be a continuum, I think we need to recognize that the mental illness, when we reach that cutoff, um, healthcare workers are notorious at not seeking help early enough. And, and in one study recently, we, we saw uh, that only 6% of people with diagnosable mental illness were actually seeking help. And yet the outcomes, especially for healthcare workers, are actually very positive when they seek help. Substance misuse rates have been climbing during this COVID uh, phase amongst healthcare workers. Now, in general, I think those of you who deal with people who have, uh, have substance misuse problems, you know that that outcome rates are not that great generally. In the UK, NHS practitioners program has shown that healthcare workers' outcomes for people with substance misuse are in the region of 80 to 90%. Fantastic outcomes rates. But the barrier is in help seeking, that people don't seek help early enough. So I think encouraging people to seek help early is important. And doing so confidentially, maintaining their dignity is important. So I think organizations can play a big role. I, as a psychiatrist, have treated many colleagues and it's been a real challenge for me to have a system whereby people can, healthcare workers can seek help confidentially, maintaining their dignity. Sometimes they're expected to seek help in their own organizations where they work. I don't think that's okay. And a lot of times I've been told that, that we don't want an elite service for our healthcare workers. Well, I don't think we want an elite service, but we want a service that provides the same degree of confidentiality and dignity that we would provide to any other patient. And we need to make sure that, that is available. And I think, I think organizations need to, need to think about how are they doing that? And, and if they're not, how should they make that available? And as individuals, I think we need to start thinking about when at least, and I say that program it in your phones, you know, all of us have get these helpline numbers and we never do anything with it. So put it in your phone so that you can signpost a colleague or indeed yourself uh, to seek help. And I think in the UK, we've, we've had the NHS practitioners program, which is free of cost. We have the psychiatrist support service, which is run by the Royal College of Psychiatrists. And we have something called the Samaritans, which I, which is one one six one two three, and it's again a free phone and a free text number. So, so I ask people to always put that in their phone and then make sure that it's available so that people can <clears throat> can access that very easily. I think data I've touched upon that is important. Research is important as well, and I think I think uh, the 
I, I do feel that research in this area has lagged behind a little bit. I think Russell and, you know, we heard this morning the speakers, I think, given us a very a strong academic base and foundation for, for this piece of work. But I think we need to know a little bit more about what, wh why are people not seeking help? Why is it only a small proportion of people seek help? And there's been a lot of focus on stigma, not enough focus on discrimination. Why are there discriminatory practices in organizations? And then how do we challenge those? Uh, because I think disclosing mental illness is not easy. Disclosing stress, burnout is not easy. It has consequences. We know that it has real consequences for people. How do we challenge and address the discrimination? Organizationally is important. And how do you normalize those conversations is important. And I feel like QI methodology can, can play a big role there. Leadership, I think everybody's touched upon it. Tony, you gave a masterclass on, on talking on that. So I'm not going to repeat that. You already talked about the importance of having the courage uh, to, to, to put this at the forefront of the organization and ensuring the values of equity and justice, you know, uh, permeate the organization is, is absolutely vital. So, <clears throat> but I'm, a, I'm an educator and I think I'm going to um, end by talking about the importance of training. And I will highlight the importance of lived experience in training. I, I really feel that um, that learning from evidence is, is very useful and expertise is very helpful, but it's absolutely vital that we also have lived experience. And I think when people speak about their own experience, they share their personal narratives, it's very, very powerful. And I've been running a program which I founded called Doctor One in Four, where doctors with their lived experience of mental illness or their ex lived experience of chronic physical illness come and talk to um, organizations uh, boards, board members, um, come and talk to, to um, you know, uh, colleagues. And the feedback is absolutely electric. You know, I think I'll be, I, I, I'm, I'm fortunate in the programs we run generally get very good feedback. Our medical students rate our program as nine over 10, but even by our standards, this is something out of the, out of the park. You know, I think people have been giving fantastic feedback to this program. And in fact, the program that started for medical students, we've asked, we are trainees, and what started for psychiatrists, we've had gynecologists and pediatricians and obstetricians and oncologists wanted to join the program. And now we've been running joint programs for the mental health trust and the acute trust. And the reason for this is this, everybody kind of feels they need to know this. They need to know, what do I do if I'm a doctor and I'm feeling stressed? Do I report to the GMC? Do I not report to the GMC? How do I do it? What should I say? What should I not say? So there are lots of practical questions that people have. So having that lived experience is, is very important. And I, and I feel that's another, another area that IIOPM could take a lead in and, and promote. And I think uh, I'm happy to share details if people want that later on. But I think bringing that is quite important. And the bringing important well-being approaches people have touched upon, so I won't uh, go on it again. But public health approach is important. So I think, I think prevention is, we all know, is important. I think um, we haven't really touched upon climate change today. We haven't. But that's a big issue. And I think... Um, and, and one of the key ways in which we can help that is by prevention. Sustainability is very much tied in with prevention. And I think if we can prevent illness, then it's a, we are creating a more sustainable world. And so I think, uh, I think that message I think has to go out. And I think our work that we do through IIOPM and other organizations has to tie in with the broader agenda of sustainability and climate change, because I think that is a direct contribution that we will be making to that agenda. And I think it's really important that we don't forget that message. So I'm going to stop there. Um, I think it's been a great morning. I've learned a lot. And um, I, I look forward to, you know, having more questions and discussions about this topic. Thank you. So both fantastic and stimulating talk, um, <clears throat> particularly about the well-being initiatives for healthcare professionals. Please stay with us for uh, questions from the audience. I think I would like to say that we have another 15, 20 minutes to take um, some questions. We have all the three speakers here. You can pose a question to speakers directly, or you can put it on the chat line. So we'll pick it, pick up the questions. Um, anyone want to kind of um, ask a first question? Does uh, any of the speakers want to ask each other any questions in terms of? Um, particular area that you're interested to clarify or? So let me kick off maybe. Okay, Tarek, you go ahead. No, sorry. Uh, go, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, Professor Dawe. No, okay. no, Russell, I had a question for you. I mean, Russell, you've got a lot of international experience. You, you, you've been, um, you know, you, you've seen this from 
uh, many different perspectives you know high income countries low income countries middle income countries everywhere uh, what do you feel about uh, the community resilience you know and i think i think a lot of the times um, in thinking about initiatives uh, in many um, uh, and I certainly think of the UK, the initiatives are focused on, on individuals rather than communities. And I, I talk about communities of, of us, us as a community of healthcare workers. And, and, and do you feel that there is a role for us to have that supportive community? And I think how, how do you see that their role in prevention? And what are the lessons we can learn maybe from uh, other countries where they are not so well resourced, but actually have that community, you know? Uh- I, I think it's a good question that uh, you've brought in uh, because the uh, community, we're talking of the health workforce. Uh, uh, I, th- I think that that's a great uh, um, uh, area that we can bring resilience there. I, I see, I mean, I'm hearing and seeing from uh, uh, in, in UK, some of the issues that you're dealing with in, in, like, uh, uh, in terms of several reports on looking at a lot of death you had a lot of losses, is that right? Medical workforce and health workforce and so forth. Um, I, I, um, I just certainly think when I, when I look, I, I was at uh, uh, two weeks ago, we had a meeting with Vietnam and uh, the, they seem to have done, I, I don't know if it was noticed, but we were surprised that they have 33 deaths uh, in the whole, in the whole thing. And I, I asked, um, and actually, no, no, no um, medical work. Uh, so I asked the question: How did you do? They had thousand four hundred cases, and uh, they said we have a lot of trust. We trust our government. We trust uh, you know that type of thing. And so we did. Um, uh, we did the right. You know, we felt we did the right thing, and things did. That's one way of looking. So I wonder uh, what you're saying is, of course, the uh, resilience community, may the health healthcare workforce having resilience and, and, and so forth. Uh, in 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 Australia, we've had we've been pretty. Uh, I must say there was there have been infection and so forth, but uh, um, and they had some um, uh, inquiries and so forth. But I think there there is a place for that, and there is a a reason, and I'm not sure uh, how we compare when we take the developed world and the developing world. And in this one uh, time, we we noticed or we see that um, the the de- developed world isn't doing as uh, hasn't done necessarily as well as some of the other areas. And this is uh, something that has come up. Uh, in 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 okay. some of our discussions, yeah. so that's an excellent um, thing to focus on. Thanks, okay, Professor Disouza, we have a question from Pratiksha Patel. She wants to ask you a question. Uh, I think she is joining live. Pratiksha. I think her question is. Okay, I can uh, unmute myself now. Can you hear oh, me? Yes, 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 yes uh, please. Uh, so, first of all, uh, wanted to uh, congratulate all three speakers. I think it was an excellent uh, presentation. I have enjoyed thoroughly. Uh, Dr. Russell, Professor Russell, I wanted to just ask a question on your uh, insightful talk. For leaders, the embitterment and disengagement is a is a really critical issue, and it loses a lot of um, uh, workforce in terms of uh, they are passive aggressive and they are not present at the workplace. How do you actually identify the individuals which are suffering from embitterment and disengagement? Well, you think that one of the things that I I uh, first and foremost you must uh, the uh, you must be aware that there is such a thing as embitterment and this embitterment, while uh, it might be uh, genuinely felt or it might be, a pa- you know, we talked about personality and number of factors from the individual and a number of factors that uh, from the organization that could, uh, could do, could actually uh, cause or 
perpetuate or, you know, but I think the very important factor is how many, uh, many of the management or many of the leaders might not be aware of this. And, okay. and I think one of the things when we understand, particularly from Lyndon's work of how uh, this percip this uh, uh, the uh, um, in, in, the uh, embittment stemming from the psychology of justice, where injustice is seen as impacting on the worldview or the belief system of that individual, and the need for them to fight back and to, and I think if we understand that, uh, that itself is a is important uh, that you start. Uh, to be able to, and we talked about the buddy system in HR, where we, uh, when there is an investigation, and often these people end up in uh, HR investigations and so forth, uh, you know, they report it. So it, 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 from what the evidence we have, that seems to perpetuate work, make it as a fight. And that, in fact, has been shown to be um, cause in some ways, uh, some resilience, uh, some resistance to treatment. So you're giving therapy. Most of the period, uh, the, I know a uh, number of our psychiatrists in, in work cover, uh, they find uh, trying to manage embitterment as uh, rather difficult because in some part, uh, the person who's um, having the embitterment needs to continue to be bitter because they need, th their world has to be proved that, you know, it is, uh, injustice to them. So if we know this and then we have, uh, uh, I think the, the leaders know about it and if we can take some preventive or will you say um, uh, situation or make the workplace more, um, you know, while there is a, the individual part there, but there's also the workplace that, and I think just the fact that we're showing all this now, we're having work I'm sure many many of the leaders will now will be uh, um, uh, and mentoring the leaders, mentoring management, men mentoring supervisors can uh, you know help in because we see a seventy percent drop in in cognitive performance and cognitive productivity. So it is uh, again one of the causes of presenteeism in the workplace, uh, which the person who's having this is not deemed to be. Uh, uh, um, diagnosed with sickness and so on, on leave. The person is very much there at work, but not performing. So ultimately, it's a loss to everyone. Thank it you is. for that. It was a very important question. How do we how do we understand, manage, and that lead to good outcomes? Yes. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Uh, we have a question for Tony Gaty from Dr. Radhakrishna Rao from India, Medical Director of Pritma Hospitals. Tony, are you uh, Yeah, an excellent session so far. Uh, excellent talks, actually. So being from the management, I would like to have a, a question to Tony Getty. Do you believe uh, this pandemic has established a new normal with regards to human resource management when it comes to engagement and their loyalty and their work culture? And uh, is it going to stay or it's just a, a passing thing that after the COVID thing completely settles, we are going, going to go back to the, our previous uh, practices? Uh, thanks very much for the question. It's, very, it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, the blunt answer is no, I don't believe it has. Um, but I do believe it has the potential to do it. Um, uh, I, I don't think enough people have woken up to the fact that, that actually uh, what's happened has taken lots of us back to, to, to the basics. Um, and, and a lot of those basics, basic skills, basic ways of treating people uh, are actually life enhancing. And, and they've been lost in organizations as organizations have been pressurized to perform or get bigger or be more successful or uh, more dynamic, but whatever the ethos has been. Um, but, but a lot of that has been, is, is in my view, fundamentally flawed in the long term. Uh, and the pandemic to me provides an opportunity for, for really good leaders to sit back and go, actually, how do I reinvigorate my organization in a way that really uh, gives a workforce who want to be here, who don't want to go somewhere else, who, who actually really 
want to enjoy a balance between enjoying their work, but also enjoying their lives. So I, I think the pandemic has provided us with a bit of takeout time to reflect um, on uh, some of the missed attributes that we should welcome back into our workplaces. Uh, I'm not sure how many people will follow it, but but I'd like to think in five and 10 years time, when we look back, we will see that organizations that have differentiated themselves from others will be ones that actually have, have embraced some of the real basic lessons uh, about simply being kind to people uh, and treating people with, with kindness. Um, and, I, and I think that will, that will be a differentiator in 10 years time. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tony, for that response. Um, the next question I have is from Dr. Banu Chatalavada, consultant psychiatrist. Uh, this is a question to uh, Professor Dave. How do we know BAME risk assessments are effective and how can we measure that? Hi, Banu, good question, thanks. Um, uh, so the short answer is that we would not have known until uh, the um, maybe middle of this year but in the last few months, I think there has been a risk register set up now and the race observatory has been also been started. And so I think we will be able to hopefully correlate uh, because also all the healthcare organizations have been asked uh, to file the returns in terms of the risk assessment they've done. <clears throat> so we should be able to get that information and correlate it. So yeah, it's an academic research project and it, we probably may not see the findings the middle of next year or so, but I think we, we probably will see whether whether a any risk assessment is effective at all, and if so, whether um, a particular one is more effective than, than others. You know, I think so. But I, I hope that we will get some answers that will be helpful. Thank you, Subha, for that. I'm going to ask the last question for this session, and this is a question from Dr. Gillian Kirk, consultant psychiatrist. She's asking. Could I ask the speakers if they could each give us one take home message from their talk to share with colleagues, please? What one thing would you like to disseminate? So for each of you, we have one message to give before we end this session. Over to you, uh, Russell, only one message, Dr. Kirk is requesting. <laughs> Do you ask me, is it, uh, Srikant? Yes, Russell, yes. Well, I, I, I think the one message is to be aware of this concept of uh, embitterment. And if we are aware of it, then if we would be able to, uh, to uh, uh, reduce not only suffering, but also productivity, both for the individual and for the organization. Wonderful. Tony, over to you. One message you want to give us. Mine's very simple. It's, it's just be kind. I and mean, it's simple to do and it's incredibly rewarding. Fantastic. So both. So, yeah, I think I put, uh, I've cheated a bit in the text box, but I think my one message would be that um, as organizations, we need to think of how would we differentiate between stress and burnout and mental illness and, and think about how would we, how would we provide differential support for those two ends of the spectrum. Fantastic. So I think we had a wonderful session with fantastic talks and good discussion. I want to bring this session to a close and again, we'll join in uh, another 20 minutes. In fact, 30 minutes, we are not on time. So we'll start again at one o'clock with the next session. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks very Thank much. you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Shrikant and all, all the others, Derek and Subud. Nice to see you and all our Thank friends. You. And you, and you. Thank you so much, Rigan. Very well organized, and I really enjoyed the session. Look forward to the afternoon. Yes. Thank, Thank, you you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And and good to 